Hey guys, Mr. Klein here, and I'm at the entrance of Rip Van Winkle Gardens at Jefferson Island, outside of New Iberia, Louisiana. So it's a local tourist attraction and a magnet for picturesque weddings with pleasant gardens, a Victorian mansion, a nice restaurant, and a brick chimney sticking out of the lake. Wait a minute, uh, there's a chimney sticking out of the lake? Of course, that chimney isn't there by accident. Well, it's actually there because of an accident. The accident, of course, occurred on the 20th of November, 1980, when the salt dome beneath it was pierced by an oil drilling rig, well, causing a partial collapse of the salt dome and the eventual draining of the entire lake into the hole. So at the time, it was the largest man-made sinkhole in history and forever changed the geology and ecosystem of the lake. So in today's video, what we're gonna do is we're gonna explore the formation of the Jefferson Island Salt Dome, how salt was mined out of the salt dome and how the lake disappeared. So let's go ahead and let's get started. Jefferson Island is one of a series of large salt domes that form a line across the central coast of Louisiana. So salt domes form when a piece of an ocean or a smaller sea gets cut off from its water supply and the water evaporates. What's left is a thick layer of salt. Now over time, sediment layers of dirt cover the salt and compact into rock. So once enough rock layers are pushing down on the salt, a funny thing happens. The crystalline structure of salt molecules prevents it from getting compacted as much as the rock around it. So what this means that its density is actually less than the surrounding rock. And if you know anything about pouring different liquids into a cup, you know that the least dense substance then rises to the top. The same thing occurs here. The salt slowly works its way through a weak spot in the rock layers and a salt dome is born. Salt domes exist all over the world, but here in South Louisiana, there's a massive formation of salt domes known as the Luan Salt. This salt originated from the Jurassic period, and there's over 500 salt domes below the surface of the state, with five that have pierced the surface and created a visible dome. In a line from northwest to southeast, there's Jefferson Island, where I'm at here, Avery Island, that's where Tabasco sauce is made, Weeks Island, Cote Blanche Island, and Belle Isle, which is southwest of Morgan City in the Atchafalaya River Delta. So you might be confused if you hear me refer to this place as Jefferson Island and then look on the map only to see that it's no island. Um, that's because the term island actually refers to the fact that the salt dome rises above the surrounding landscape, which is only a few feet above sea level like an island. Avery Island is the tallest of these salt domes with a high point of about 150 feet or about 50 meters above sea level. Jefferson Island here is about 75 feet or 23 meters above sea level. Also, all but Jefferson Island are actually surrounded by marsh, yet because of their elevation, they have trees and wildlife, much like the surrounding places uh, in the inland. So in another way, it makes them another bit of an island. It's an island of the inland in the middle of a marsh. The salt dome that creates Jefferson Island is relatively circular in shape with a diameter of two miles. So most of the salt dome actually resides underneath Lake Pignure right here, which was most likely formed due to the land above the dome sinking over time. Before the disaster, it was extremely shallow across the entire lake with an average depth of anywhere from three to six feet with the deepest portions of the lake, not much deeper than your average swimming pool, so 12 to 15 feet deep. Jefferson Island has evidence of Pleistocene megafauna, including fossils of American mastodons as well as pure European native populations living in the area. European settlers came in the 1700s, and the location was known by several different names, including Cote Carline, Dupuis Island, Miller's Island, and Orange Island until the land was purchased by one Joseph Jefferson, who made his career playing Rip Van Winkle in theaters worldwide. He built this giant Victorian mansion to serve as his hunting lodge, with plenty of famous people in making their way over there, including former President Grover Cleveland, who apparently took plenty of naps in underneath this tree. So during an attempt to drill a water well in 1895, salt was found approximately 334 feet or 101 meters below the surface, leading the owners to explore creating a salt mine like the ones already in operation at Avery Island and Weeks Island. So in 1919, the digging of the first mine shaft began and mining operations started in 1922. The first level of the mine was 800 feet below the surface and the salt rock was drilled and blasted into small enough pieces to remove. The salt was loaded into rail cars with electric shovels and then brought to a central area 
where it was then crushed and then placed into bins. Containers with a capacity of five tons then brought the salt to the surface where it was loaded into shallow draft barges and brought down Bayou Carlin that drained the lake and flows into the Gulf of Mexico, which actually right around here is actually where the barges were loaded. Within a decade, over 200,000 tons of salt was mined from Jefferson Island. And by 1940, the mine was deep into about 1,000 feet or 330 meters below the surface. The mine was sold to Diamond Crystal in 1957, and they opened up mining operations 1,300 feet below the surface. By 1980, a fourth level, 1,500 feet or nearly 500 meters below the surface was being mined for salt, with plans actually in place to begin a new level 1,800 feet down. The levels were mined in alternating patterns in order to keep the mine structurally sound, with large rooms that ranged in size from 65 feet square with a 90 foot ceiling at 800 feet to 240 foot squares with a ceiling of 75 feet at the 1500 foot level. So in designing the 1500 foot mining area, geotechnical consultants noted that the western edge of the salt dome was showing instability due to the more narrow pillars at the higher mining levels. And they figured this out because there was surface subsidence or sinking in places of at rates of up to 10 inches or 25 centimeters per year. Salt domes form in places of weaknesses in sedimentary rock layers, which means that the fringes of salt domes, you have fractures where the layers break. This is the perfect place for oil and natural gas deposits to collect and form small reservoirs. Before explorations to develop a salt mine had even begun, Belle Isle, for instance, had oil operations in place since the early 1900s. At Lake Pignure, Texaco had a lease to perform explorations to see if there was oil to be extracted. And they hired Wilson Brothers, who was a oil, local oil company, to drill exploratory wells on the lease. So there were two drilling rigs set up here at Lake Pignure. So one was along the lake's south shoreline and one that was in the lake known as P-20. So P-20 was set up on wooden pilings because the water in the area was far too shallow for a traditional offshore rig. So this had not actually been the first time oil drilling rigs had been set up on the lake itself. In fact, part of the contract with Texaco and the state was that in exchange for permission to drill, Texaco would have to remove the hundreds of wooden pilings that were sunk at the bottom of the lake. This was in order to make the lake more attractive to fishermen. So P-20 was to investigate three possible formations where oil would be at. So at 3,7400 and 7,950 feet below the surface. So according to calculations, the drilling would be at its closest only 50 feet from the salt formation, which was well within regulations. The reason being is that the drill pipe was only about 14 inches in diameter. So if engineers found it necessary to move the drig to another hole, they could only do so along a 150 foot line running east to west. The reason being that any movement of the rig from north to south could actually pose a threat to puncturing the salt dome. The rig crew actually had experience drilling close to salt domes in the past and the Wilson foreman on the rig after the accident stated in the report that there was really no reason to believe that we would even hit salt at all and even if it did it would be highly abnormal and at worst it would just be a small pocket of salt that it separated from the dome itself. P-20 began drilling on November 18, 1980 and on 4.40 a.m. on November 20th on a clear morning just like this they had drilled approximately 1,250 feet below the surface when suddenly the drill became stuck. Efforts to remove the drill placed strains of over 200,000 pounds on the rig which really confused the crew because this was nowhere near normal for a stuck drill. The drill Driller on the rig stated that he heard popping sounds below the rig. The crew also noticed shortly afterward that the rig was beginning to tilt. Within an hour though, the rig was evacuated and supporting barges were released from the platform because it had dropped two to three feet in one corner. Texaco officials had finally arrived at Lake Pignure and within minutes they were stunned to see the rig overturn and begin sinking beneath the surface at 7.25 a.m. This, of course, wasn't supposed to happen as at the drilling site the water was less than 11 feet deep. Sometime between 8.15 and 8.30 a.m., an official from the mine met with the rig workers to inform them that the salt mine was beginning to flood. Down in the mine, the first sign that something was going wrong occurred at around 8.10 a.m. when Junius Gaddison, who was the master electrician at the mine, was in the electrical office at the 1,500 foot level. He heard an unusual banging noise, and so whenever he looked up, he saw a stream of muddy water approximately two feet deep flowing his way. The banging that he heard was actually the result of diesel 
fuel tanks banging into each other as they bobbed along in the water. Gannison quickly shouted a warning of a leak and the mine began an emergency evacuation. Over the next hour, the 52 workers as well as three visitors from LSU who were taking a tour of the mine were evacuated in textbook fashion. So one of the most amazing parts of this entire ordeal was that there were no fatalities, which really is a testament to the professionalism of the miners down in the mine as well as the oil field workers on the P-20 and nearby 35 rig. Once everyone was on the surface, Diamond Salt began the search for the cause of the flooding in the mine and quickly surmised that the drilling rig must have had something to do with it. The precise location of P-20 was determined just as the drag line was slipping below the surface and calculations from this indicated that the rig did indeed pierce the mine. So as Texaco, Diamond Salt, and the U.S. Mine Safety and Health Administration officials gathered to determine the cause and how best to handle what was going on, Lake Pignure was beginning to show a scene of biblical proportions. The flooding in the mine became a torrent at the 1300 foot level, creating a quarter mile diameter whirlpool at the site of the drilling rig. Witnesses described the whirlpool as looking like a bathtub draining with a tugboat, 11 barges, both Texaco drilling rigs, yes, even the one on land, going down the drain. By noon, the Delcom Canal or Bayou Carlin actually reversed its course and began draining into the lake rather than flowing into the Gulf of Mexico. The waters created a 160 foot or about 155 meter waterfall, which still to this day is the tallest waterfall the state has ever had. And that waterfall continued until the hole was eventually filled. So as though a quarter mile whirlpool, a waterfall, an entire lake disappearing wasn't enough, there was one more surprise left in this from the mine. So what was happening is as the mine was being filled up, the air inside was being compressed and it ended up being expelled through the main shaft and air shaft through the mine. So at about 1 p.m. there was a large bang and a 400 foot geyser of mud and water flew out of the air shaft. It covered a 100 foot diameter circle and really fine silt. So the force of this explosion of air was so great that the lifting cage in the air shaft was actually mangled by the impact of the air. After a couple days, the Delcom Canal slowly refilled as Lake Pignure reached its normal surface level, with nine of the 11 barges popping back up to the surface to be recovered at a later date. So Lake Pignure was a freshwater lake before, but with all the salt water from the canal and Vermilion Bay coming in, no, not the salt from the salt dome as sometimes stated in videos and documents online, the lake became more brackish in nature, which changed the ecosystem within it. So as a result, the lake also went from having its deepest point only being about 15 feet deep to over 200 feet or 65 meters deep at the site of the drilling rig where it punctured the salt dome. The partial collapse of the salt dome caused approximately 65 acres of land to be lost to the lake. At Rip Van Winkle Gardens, a home fell into the lake, leaving the iconic chimney sticking out of the water just off the shoreline. In addition, over 20 greenhouses at the neighboring Live Oak Gardens were destroyed as the land that they were sitting on fell into the lake as well. Seismic monitoring over several weeks showed that the breach in the salt dome had been filled and had been sealed actually through natural processes. The reason being is that the water deep below in the former mine was saturated with salt. So within days, both Diamond Salt and Texaco had both filed lawsuits against each other with Live Oak Garden suing both companies as well. So just before trial, all of the companies settled with each other. So Texaco and Wilson Drilling paid Diamond Crystal $45 million in damages since the mine was permanently closed and $12.8 million to Live Oak Gardens for the loss of the property and materials. The federal government released a report on the disaster in August of 1981, so it didn't place any official blame because, well, you know, the evidence was flooded underground. However, the report did mention in its findings and its recommendations that in future instances, salt domes be better mapped and oil companies communicate better with mines when attempting drilling exploration near a salt dome. Unofficially, though, it seems that a mapping error may have been the initial cause of the disaster, as surveying data used to determine the place of the oil rig was used with a different datum or a reference area of where latitude and longitude would be used to actually set up the rig. So the result was that the rig was drilling about 400 feet from where it was actually supposed to have been drilling according to the maps. So there you go, the Lake Pignier disaster in a nutshell. It's amazing how something as tiny as a 14 inch drill pipe or a tiny surveying error could cause such a huge disaster. Yet we're, here we are. There were so many amazing things that went on this location. Now today, Lake Pignure really is a great place to visit for locals and tourists alike. You can take in a slice of sports
sportsman's paradise as well as seeing a really unique piece of Louisiana geology. Oh, and I guess the Victorian mansion and really fancy gardens as well. This has been an episode of Phenomenon Explained, a series of videos that attempts to explain how things work in the world around us. This video aligns to the next generation science standards as well as the Louisiana student standards for science. This episode covers ms ESS 2-2, which explains how Earth's surface changes slowly in the case of a salt dome forming, or quickly in the case of a lake draining because of an oil well punching said salt dome. If you like this video, please click on the like button. If you want to see more content like this, click on the subscribe button as well as the bell icon to be notified of new releases. As always, I hope you really enjoyed this video, and thanks for watching.